Welcome to Washington Today on C-SPAN Radio for Friday, December 23rd, 2022. U.S. House Representatives passing the $1.7 trillion omnibus spending bill to fund the federal government, mostly along party lines, with Democrats supporting it and Republicans in opposition. The Senate already passed the omnibus bill, so it goes to President Biden to be signed into law. And this comes just hours before tonight's expiration of current government funding authorization. Without a new bill, there could have been a partial government shutdown. The House January 6th committee releases its final report, concluding that one man, former President Donald Trump, is responsible for the mob of his supporters who believed his stolen election lies and violently attacked the U.S. Capitol to try to stop the peaceful transfer of power. Plus, NATO Secretary General Jan Stoltenberg reflecting on the war in Ukraine in a year-end message. And U.S. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg on the winter storms hindering holiday travel this weekend. Associated Press writes the $1.7 trillion spending bill financing federal agencies through September and providing more aid to a devastated Ukraine cleared the House on Friday as lawmakers race to finish their work for the year and avoid a partial government shutdown. Passage of the bill represented a closing act for Congresswoman Nancy Pelosi's second stint as House Speaker. And for the Democratic majority, she led back to power in the 2018 election. Republicans will take control of the House next year. Before the vote, Speaker Pelosi spoke in favor. Mr. Speaker, this bill is about our heroes, honoring our heroes, Our heroic veterans with a major increase in veterans' health care, a national security imperative that falls under the non-defense discretionary, even though we know it's part of our national security responsibility. Honoring the heroes of 9-11, delivering benefits to families that long been wrongfully denied, and bolstering funding for health programs for first responders and survivors there. Our firefighters and first responders, heroes, those who weigh in with emergency, when di- emergency disaster calls upon them for relief resources. And the extraordinary heroes in Ukraine fighting on the front lines of the battle for democracy. In this legislation, we proudly deliver another consequential round of security, economic, and humanitarian aid. And it really is not, as, a, as the President of Ukraine said the other night, it isn't about charity, it's about security, it's about working together. And what a special honor it was for us to be on the floor to hear when President Zelensky spoke powerfully about the courage and commitment, heroism, and hope of the people. And of course, our everyday heroes, America's working families, the people who make our country work, our families grow, our communities thrive, uh, securing uh, for our children, securing critical investments for their health, housing, education, economic well-being, and more on top of, under President Biden, forming nearly 10 million jobs, largely in the private sector, but with the public policy to enable that to happen. Indeed, this bill puts people over politics. Mr. Speaker, it was sad to hear the minority leader earlier say that this legislation is the most shameful thing to be seen on the House floor in this Congress. I can't help but wonder, had he forgotten January 6th? Indeed, this is the day of immense patriotism. And that patriotism, we reformed the Electoral Act of 1987 to thwart future attempts to disrupt the peaceful transfer of power. And as I've said before, here in the heart of our democracy. Mr. Speaker, this is truly a package for the people. And with immense gratitude to Chairwoman Rosa DeLauro, Patrick Leahy, to Chairman Patrick Leahy, Vice Chair Shelby, I urge strong bipartisan I vote, yield back the balance of my time, and wish everyone a happy, healthy, and safe New Year. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Happy Schwanza. Happy Hanukkah. Whatever it is you celebrate, be safe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The gentlelady yields. The gentleman reserves. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, Democrat from California, on the House floor. Also speaking in favor of the omnibus spending bill, Hakeem Jeffries, Democrat from New York, who is currently the caucus chair, number four in the House Democratic leadership, but has been elected by the House Democrats to be the leader, the number one in the next Congress that starts January 3rd. 
this spending agreement was the product of bipartisan negotiation with Democrats and Republicans in the Senate. I thank Speaker Pelosi, Chairwoman DeLauro, and all of the members of the House Democratic Caucus for their leadership in helping to make sure that this bill includes strong Democratic priorities. This legislation invests in children and families, invests in education and job training, invests in the creation and preservation of affordable housing, invests in hardworking Americans and organized labor, invests in research and development, invests in transportation and infrastructure, invests in technology and innovation, and invests in the health, safety, and well-being of the American people. This legislation reflects democratic values. Democrats in the new year will continue to fight for lower costs, better paying jobs, and safer communities, and Democrats will always put people over politics. Happy holidays and happy new year. Congressman Hakeem Jeffries, Democrat from New York, the incoming House Democratic leader today on the House floor. The $1.7 trillion bill would fund defense programs at $858 billion, about a 10 percent increase over the current fiscal year. Domestic spending is $772 billion. That's a 6 percent increase. There's also $45 billion for Ukraine, another $30-plus billion for disaster relief for U.S. areas hit by hurricanes, floods, and wildfires. And there are a lot of non-spending policy changes thrown in, one of the most prominent clarifying the way Congress counts presidential electoral votes. Leading the opposition to the bill on the House floor, Congressman Kevin McCarthy, Republican from California, the minority leader. At the very end, this will cost you more than $2 trillion. More than 4,000 pages is a train wreck. It's jam-packed with wokeism, Washington special interest, and wasteful spending that means more crushing debt to 330 million Americans and generations to come. It will make the border worse. It will make inflation worse. It will make the economy worse. It will make government worse. The American people are probably asking themselves, how did we get into this mess? I'll tell you how. Democrats failed to do their job. Mr. Speaker, if someone wants to challenge me on that, why did the American public fire you just a few months ago? Why did you wait to pass this bill if it was so great till after the election? Why did you allow the Senate, two senators, to write it that can't be held accountable, that name things after themselves? Why did you pass the CR to push it against Christmas with a storm before our very eyes? Why is the majority of Democrats not even here if you think it's so good? If this is your legacy, I feel sad for you. But more importantly, the damage you've done to America. During the last year, Democrats controlled the House, the Senate, and the presidency. And they yet to fill their most basic task. Senate Democrats passed zero appropriation bills out of their committee. They passed zero appropriation bills off the floor. Mr. Speaker, they didn't do a damn thing. They went 0 for 12. Instead of following the law and funding the government by September 30th, they did what they do best. They created a crisis. They didn't even let it go to waste. We all remember what Speaker Pelosi told us about Obamacare. You have to pass it to find out what's in it. That's exactly the same. They waited until the last minute in a lame duck Congress to dump more than 4,000 pages with $2 trillion into the laps of the American public. Do you have time to read the bill? No. Do you have time to debate the bill? No. Do we mark up the bill? No. The members of Congress here to vote on it? Nope. It's all right. We got your votes in the back pocket. I don't know where the American people asked for that. In 11 days, this all changes. We are going to reclaim this body's integrity in service to the American people after this institution covers itself in disgrace one last time.
under Democrat one-party rule. A new direction is coming. Eleven days, Republicans will deliver. I request a no vote on the omnibus, and I yield back. Gentleman reserves. The gentleman from Massachusetts is recognized. The gentleman from Massachusetts is recognized. Um, after listening to that, it's clear he doesn't have the votes yet. I reserve my time. Congressman James McGovern, Democrat from Massachusetts, commenting at the end of the speech by the minority leader Kevin McCarthy. He referenced Kevin McCarthy's run for House Speaker in the next Congress, and the media reports that he may not have the support he needs among House Republicans to be elected. Leaders of the House Appropriations Committee also speaking before today's vote on the omnibus spending bill. Democrat Rosa DeLauro of Connecticut is the chair, and Republican Kay Granger of Texas is the ranking member. Mr. Speaker, I rise in support of the fiscal year 2023 government funding legislation before us. Passed the Senate yesterday on a 68-29 vote with the support of all Democrats and 18 Republicans. It is a package of 12 appropriations bills It is a package of 12 appropriations bills that makes critical investments in the programs that our communities need. The bill also includes legislation to continue to support the Ukrainian people in their fight against Russia's ruthless aggression and to help areas of our nation devastated by recent natural disasters. And for the second year in a row, we included community projects, over 7,200, to meet urgent needs in districts all over the nation. These bills tackle our nation's toughest crises. They help lower the cost of living for hardworking families in the middle class, create better paying jobs, and protect our communities and our national security. I have spoken at length about this strong bill. I am proud of it. I urge my colleagues to support it and reserve the balance of my time. Gentlewoman reserves. Gentlewoman from Texas. Mr. Speaker. I rise today in opposition to H.R. 2617, an omnibus appropriations package to fund the government through the end of the fiscal year. First, I have concerns about the size and the scope of the package. It totals almost $2 trillion, and it comes after nearly $3 trillion of spending was pushed through this Congress, this $3 trillion was enacted completely outside of the normal process, and many programs received staggering increases. This record high spending has been a key driver of inflation. It has led to record high prices for the American people and for everything from gas to groceries. Instead of reflecting the economic realities we face, the package of bills before us represents continued spending in areas that have already received large increases. Second, this omnibus package bails out the administration for many of their self-inflicted wounds on issues like the border crisis and the energy crisis. In closing, I'm disappointed that I'm unable to support this bill that funds our nation's military at the authorized level. But the excess spending on non-defense programs in this bill is just too much to gain my support. For these reasons, I urge my colleagues to vote no, and I reserve the balance of my time. Congresswoman Kay Granger, ranking Republican on the Appropriations Committee, and Rosa DeLauro, the chair. In the next Congress, when Republicans are in the majority, those two will switch positions. Kay Granger becoming chair, Rosa DeLauro, ranking Democrat. House passed the omnibus spending bill by a vote of 225 to 201 with one voting present. The present is Democrat Rashida Tlaib of Michigan. It was almost entirely party line. Democrats yes, Republicans no. One Democrat voting no. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez of New York. And nine Republicans voting yes. John Katko of New York. Chris Jacobs of New York. Brian Fitzpatrick of Pennsylvania. Fred Upton of Michigan. Rodney Davis of Illinois. Jamie Herrera Butler of Washington State, Steve Womack from Arkansas, Adam Kinzinger of Illinois, and Liz Cheney from Wyoming. The Senate passed the funding bill Thursday by a vote of 68 to 29, so it now goes to President Biden, who put out a statement saying the bill is good for our economy, 
our competitiveness, and our communities, and I will sign it into law as soon as it reaches my desk. And he adds this bill is further proof that Republicans and Democrats can come together to deliver for the American people, and I'm looking forward to continued bipartisan progress in the year ahead. Getting the paperwork to the president, though, could take some time. With the current government spending authorization expiring midnight tonight, the House and Senate passed another extension of short-term funding, a CR or continuing resolution, to ensure the government doesn't shut down while the legislation is being enrolled, the final step before the president gets it. On Wall Street, the Dow up 176, NASDAQ up 21, S&P up 22. An inflation measure used by the Federal Reserve to make decisions about interest rates slowed in November after months of increases. The Personal Consumption Expenditures Price Index rose 5.5 percent in November versus a year earlier, down from 6.1 percent the month before. Excluding volatile food and fuel costs, core inflation was up 4.7 percent in November. That's down from 5 percent in October. A story at CNN, the House Select Committee investigating the January 6, 2021 insurrection recommends barring former President Donald Trump from holding office again. The recommendation is among the conclusions of the panel's final report, a comprehensive overview of the bipartisan panel's findings on how former President Trump and his allies sought to overturn the 2020 presidential election, released late Thursday evening. Committee member Adam Schiff, Democrat from California, was interviewed Thursday by KGTV in San Diego on the release of the final report. And he was asked whether he believes the Justice Department will prosecute former President Trump on the four charges the committee has recommended, including assisting, aiding or comforting those involved in an insurrection. Well, I certainly hope that they will do what they uh, promised from the beginning, which is follow the facts wherever they lead, because they will lead them as they led us to Donald Trump. Uh, And I also hope that they apply the same standard uh, to former presidents that they would apply to you or me, uh, that they would apply to any American. Uh, There should only be one standard for the rule of law. Uh, So that's my hope. Uh, We will find out. Only time will tell whether that takes place. But I think to give a president or former president a kind of immunity because it would be controversial to prosecute them, even when there's adequate evidence to do so, would be a very dangerous precedent to set. With more on the House January 6th Committee's final report, joining us on the phone now is Rosalind Helderman, Washington Post investigative reporter. Thank you so much for for doing this. What are the big takeaways from this report, especially related to the actions of former President Trump? Yeah, for folks who have been following the work of the committee and particularly tuned into uh, the eight public hearings that were held over the summer. Uh, This is really uh, kind of the final word, and it's much the same word as the story that we were told by the committee previously, uh, just told for history with as much detail as they were able to pack in. So uh, it's the story of how uh, Donald Trump, before the election, to call uh, it rigged, that he was told repeatedly that there were no signs of fraud, Uh, but that he uh, convinced his supporters uh, that the election had been stolen even so, and that in the committee's judgment, uh, those actions uh, led directly to the violence that the country saw on January 6th. What recommended reforms or changes are there from the committee so an attack like this never happens again? Yeah, the committee had 11 recommendations. It's interesting. You can tell uh, their, their really uh, intense focus on the former president and his conduct through their recommendations. Uh, they didn't have a lot to say, for instance, on uh, possible reforms in the Capitol Police or uh, the intelligence of the FBI or anything like that, which were topics that they spent some time studying. Uh, instead, they recommended things like uh, having Congress look at barring uh, Donald Trump from ever running for office again, uh, citing the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. Uh, they, they suggested that uh, the Insurrection Act be looked at. Uh, if, if it didn't cover this, they say the law should be changed so that it does cover this. Uh, of course, they made criminal referrals to the Department of Justice earlier in the week, uh, recommending that prosecutors actually file criminal charges over these matters. Is there evidence presented in the report that's new to the public, perhaps that didn't come out during the hearings or the witness transcripts that have been released? 
You know, there is some new evidence. Uh, this is uh, their final document uh, weaving together uh, the thousands of pages of documents and text messages and emails they gathered, as well as clips from, or I should say quotes from uh, about a thousand witness depositions that they performed. Uh, so, you know, as you read through, uh, there are some new quotes, there are some new moments that hadn't previously been out. Uh, but, you know, in their overall contours, uh, those details serve uh, the story that the committee has been telling now for a number of months. I wouldn't say that there are any sort of bombshell revelations out of this report. We're talking with Rosalind Helderman from The Washington Post. You have an article at WashingtonPost.com about the relationship between a name that came up during the January 6th committee hearings, John Eastman, and Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. What did you find? Yeah, um, you know, it had come out previously uh, that John Eastman exchanged a couple of emails with Ginny Thomas, the, uh, the justice's wife, uh, in this time period uh, that was published today. Uh, looked at his relationship actually with Clarence Thomas. And one of the things we found is that uh, the two men have actually known each other for about 30 years. They first met in the 1980s uh, before Justice Thomas had even joined the Supreme Court uh, and that they know each other quite well. Uh, and they, they also sort of developed their views of the Constitution around the same school of of thinkers uh, in the 1980s, and they, they share a lot of the same interpretation of how you should look at the Constitution, uh, some views that even separate them from other conservatives. And going back to the uh, January 6th committee final report, the committee itself is going away in just a week or two for with the new Congress. But what's planned perhaps uh, regarding investigations concerning that attack with the new Congress coming in? Well, we know that the uh, first of all, I should say the Justice Department um, has its own investigation looking at whether um, uh, there was any criminal activity by the same group of people. Uh, that investigation um, has been expanding in recent months. There's been a lot of subpoenas, and we don't know how that will end. Uh, when Republicans take the House uh, in January, uh, we expect them to do a certain amount of investigating of the investigators, if you will, uh, pouring through the records of the January 6th committee, looking for uh, missteps by that committee, uh, places where they highlighted uh, damaging testimony but did not highlight potentially exculpatory evidence that they also gathered, um, basically to, to kind of and see if they can undo some of what, of what the uh, Democratic-led committee had found. Rosalind Helderman is a Washington Post investigative reporter. Her stories at WashingtonPost.com and on Twitter, it's at PostRoz. Thank you very much and happy holidays. Thank you so much for having me. Former President Trump posting on his social media platform Truth Social after release of the January 6th committee's final report Thursday night. The highly partisan unselect committee report purposely fails to mention the failure of Pelosi to heed my recommendation for troops to be used in D.C., show the peacefully and patriotically words I used, or study the reason for the protest, election fraud. And then in capital letters, he writes, witch hunt. A trial in Arizona that challenges the election results in the race for governor finishing up this week. Republican Carrie Lake, who lost to Democrat Katie Hobbs by about 17,000 votes, is claiming widespread intentional misconduct in Maricopa County cost her the election. A lawyer representing Katie Hobbs, Abna Khanna, saying to the judge on Thursday that Carrie Lake's lawyers did not provide any evidence and, quote, what we got instead was just loose threads and gaping plot holes. We know now that her story was a work of fiction. Carrie Lake spoke outside the courthouse when the trial finished. We proved without a shadow of a doubt that there was malicious intent that caused disruption so great it changed the results of the election. I'm incredibly proud of both Brian Blem and Kurt Olson who led up this legal team. We provided expert testimony. We provided experts. The other side brought in activists to try to save face. They admitted that they've known about these ballot problems. They're ballot problems. Now they're trying to say that it's been going on for three elections. Our elections are a mess in this country. And I am so happy to stand up and say, no longer will we as Americans put up with this. We demand fair, honest, transparent elections, and we will get them. 
and I pray so hard for this judge. I think that he really took in all of that information. I think he listened very closely to what happened. And I am fighting for the people of Arizona, but not just for the people of Arizona. I'm fighting for the people of this country and for our future. If we don't have honest elections where we decide who represents us, then we don't have a country anymore. And you know, the, you know, the defendants, their attorney said it in his, closing, in his closing statement. He said, we choose our rulers. Isn't that telling? Hmm. This was a selection, not an election. And we in America choose who represents us. And we will restore honest elections. And I will never stop fighting. I will never stop fighting. So thank you very much. Carrie Lake, former Republican candidate for Arizona governor outside the Maricopa County Courthouse on Thursday at the conclusion of the trial that claims election fraud led to her loss. That video from the Arizona Republic newspaper. As this trial goes to the judge, Governor-elect Katie Hobbs is planning her inauguration on January 5th. Washington Today continues in a moment. Listening to programs on C-SPAN through C-SPAN Radio just got easier. Tell your smart speaker, play C-SPAN Radio, and listen to Washington Journal daily at 7 a.m. Eastern. Important congressional hearings and other public affairs events throughout the day and weekdays at 5 p.m. and 9 p.m. Eastern. Catch Washington Today for a fast-paced report on the stories of the day. Listen to C-SPAN anytime. Just tell your smart speaker, play C-SPAN Radio. C-SPAN, powered by cable. Welcome back to Washington Today, which you can get as a podcast wherever you get your podcasts and on the C-SPAN Now mobile app. From a New York Times article, President Volodymyr Zelensky of Ukraine declared on Friday that Ukraine was working toward victory, buoyed by his hero's welcome in Washington and a brief visit to Poland in a sprint of diplomacy aimed at thanking his country's most robust allies and cementing their support. Mr. Zelensky was back in Kiev after his trip, which has boosted morale in a country where millions have been plunged into darkness and cold from Russian missile strikes that have knocked out power as winter sets in. In a brief evening address on Thursday, while en route home, he expressed satisfaction with his landmark visit to Washington, insisting that it had heated good results and will really help with Ukraine's ongoing war effort. That from the New York Times. NATO Secretary General Jan Stoltenberg posting a year-end video at the NATO website talking about the war in Ukraine and NATO's role. Hello to all our service members. This year has been a year like no other. Russia's illegal war of aggression in Ukraine has made our world more dangerous. Faced with the biggest security crisis in Europe since World War II, NATO has responded with strength and unity. Within hours of the invasion, we activated our defense plans. We now have over 40,000 troops under NATO command in the eastern part of the lines, backed by substantial capabilities in the air and at sea. We have doubled the number of battle groups from four to eight, and we will continue to strengthen our deterrence and defense. What you, our armed forces, do sends a clear message to Moscow and to anyone who would challenge us. NATO is here. We will protect and defend every inch of our territory. This year, I have had the privilege to meet many of you, exercising in Norway, defending the skies from Rammstein Air Command, serving aboard the USS George H.W. Bush aircraft carrier, in our deployments from the Baltic to the Black Sea, or training Ukrainian forces in the United Kingdom. I have seen how professional, committed and capable you are. So I want to take this opportunity to personally thank all of you wherever you are deployed. NATO Secretary General Jan Stoltenberg in a year-end video message. A number of news outlets reporting that Russian President Vladimir Putin calling the fighting in Ukraine a war for the first time at a news conference on Thursday. But the New York Times Moscow bureau chief disagrees, writing, In the Kremlin's logic, it is the West and the Ukrainian government that started a war against Russian speakers in eastern Ukraine in 2014 after the pro-Western revolution in Kyiv earlier that year. And Russia's current invasion, that logic goes, is a special operation designed to end that war. 
Of the nearly $50 billion the U.S. has given Ukraine since Russia's invasion, about half has been for weapons and security assistance, the other half humanitarian and financial aid. Samantha Power is the head of USAID, the U.S. Agency for International Development. She talks about the help given to the Ukrainian people and people in dozens of other countries in her end-of-the-year video post. As this year winds down to a close, I want every American to know the good that their country is doing in places all around the world, helping some of the people in greatest need overcome some of the planet's toughest challenges. In 2022, the United States responded to crises and natural disasters in 64 countries, including the floods in Pakistan and the massive ongoing drought in the Horn of Africa. We surged assistance to brave Ukrainians facing the harrowing effects of Putin's war by boosting Ukraine's grain exports, supporting the Ukrainian government as they deliver critical services, and helping the country brace for winter as Moscow devastates the country's infrastructure. We tackled the largest hunger crisis in modern history by providing billions in immediate relief, distributing life-saving supplements to malnourished children, partnering with the private sector to address fertilizer shortages, and investing in agriculture around the world so farmers can help feed their communities. We continued our effort to help vaccinate the world by donating over 670 million COVID-19 vaccines to more than 116 countries and launching a global vaccination effort to help those countries get shots in arms. We worked with countries to address the climate crisis by installing gigawatts of clean energy and protecting critical forests and carbon sinks while helping communities adapt to the fiercer storms, droughts, wildfires, and other climate shocks that are already upon us. We launched the largest ever initiative to bring the Israeli and Palestinian people together through person-to-person peace building. We advance democracy around the world by fighting corruption, supporting activists and civil society, and mobilizing additional support for countries where democratic reformers have a mandate for change. We visited historically black colleges and universities and minority serving institutions throughout the country to recruit new classes of foreign service professionals so that the face of America that we show to the world actually looks like America. We launched our biggest effort ever to make sure that America's foreign assistance invests in strengthening the organizations, institutions, and entrepreneurs that are from the communities in which we work. We worked with companies like Bayer, Vodafone, Google, and MasterCard to design partnerships that encourage private companies to contribute to the public good. Your support allows us to show the world the best of America, that we are compassionate, that we are highly competent, and that our fates are connected to the fates of people everywhere. Each of you is part of our mission to extend the reach of human dignity to everyone everywhere. On behalf of all of us at USAID, thank you and happy holidays. USAID Administrator Samantha Power in a video put out by her agency. The pre-Christmas weekend travel rush is on, but the cold wind and snow have been slowing things down a bit. Bloomberg News writes, winter storms pummeling vast areas of the U.S. are prompting widespread flight cancellations and delays from East Coast hubs to the Pacific Northwest, upending airline operations during the busy holiday travel season. U.S. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg was interviewed this morning on MSNBC about what to expect with air travel. After all that progress we saw going into the fall, as you mentioned, we had that conversation around Thanksgiving where we had extraordinarily smooth flight operations and was uh, hopeful that uh, things in in terms of the the backbone of the system had continued to improve, but really needed the weather to cooperate too going into the holidays. And to say we have the opposite of cooperative (laughs) weather would would be an understatement. Uh, You know, uh, the, the whole system feels that when you have one or two major airline hubs impacted. Uh, Right now, 
now we have multiple major airline hubs impacted. And so uh, uh, in the northwest, they're dealing with uh, uh, more snow coming in. Uh, in the east, it's really the winds that we're worried about. And in the middle of the country, it's those extreme cold temperatures that can uh, make it hard for ground operations to continue. Just think about, I know they make it look easy, uh, but think about those crews and how long they can safely, physically uh, be out there servicing the aircraft. Uh, and so it just becomes that much more difficult for the airlines. Uh, yesterday, uh, about 10% of flights uh, canceled. Now, of course, that means 90% of flights were not canceled, but, uh, you know, if it goes above 2%, we consider that a lot. So 10% means uh, just a lot of disruption for a lot of passengers. Now, uh, if there's any good news, it's that the, the storm has uh, moved quickly over some areas. Denver, for example, where some of the biggest impacts were felt uh, yesterday, now getting back to normal. But uh, we're seeing, again, over the middle of the country, that extreme cold, and then the east, uh, that uh, that wind and snow coming. It's, it's going to be uh, rough right. for uh, <laughs> certainly the, the next couple of days when it comes to aviation. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg on MSNBC Friday morning. Storms also putting in jeopardy the on-time arrival of Christmas presents. UPS reports significant weather events affecting their air and ground services, including their hubs in Louisville, Kentucky and Rockford, Illinois. And FedEx says there are substantial disruptions at its hubs in Indianapolis and Memphis, Tennessee, due to severe winter weather that has created potentially hazardous operating conditions. As members of the U.S. House and Senate leave Washington, heading back to their districts and states for the holidays, some tweeting some greetings, including Senators Chuck Grassley and Joe Manchin. Merry Christmas and happy holidays to all. This, we know, is a very special time of year, and I hope you're able to enjoy and celebrate the blessings of the holiday season and do it with family and friends. Whether you're celebrating the season of lights or the birth of our Lord and Savior, Barbara and I wish you all the very best. Public service is a true blessing, and I'm grateful that Iowans continue to put their trust in me. Have a very Merry Christmas and Happy Hanukkah and a Happy New Year. On behalf of Gail, myself, and the entire Manchin family, we wish all West Virginians and Americans a Merry Christmas and a Happy Holidays. During this season of giving and reflection, Gail and I are reminded of the importance of family, the source of life's greatest joys and deepest bonds. Growing up in Farmington, my parents taught me that if you can count your blessings, you can share your blessings. This lesson has stuck with me throughout my life, and it is a message I have proudly passed along to my children and grandchildren. We are blessed to have loving families and friends, a beautiful state to call home, and the knowledge that we are truly a statewide community with an unbreakable bond. In West Virginia, we look out for one another during good times and bad. Not only is this good for the soul, but it makes West Virginia the best place to work, live, and raise a family. Gail and I encourage all West Virginians to join us this holiday season and praying for the safety of our fellow West Virginians, frontline workers, service members, and veterans, as well as thanking them for their service to our nation. Let us also pray for peace, joy, and a greater understanding of one another that can bring our nation closer together. As this year comes to a close, let us all reflect on our many blessings and look forward to a healthy and happy new year. May God continue to bless the great state of West Virginia and the United States of America. videos from Senators Joe Manchin, Democrat from West Virginia, and Chuck Grassley, Republican from Iowa. President Biden gave a Christmas address at the White House on Thursday on, as the White House describes it, what unites us as Americans, optimism for the year ahead, and wishing Americans joy in the coming year. So my hope this Christmas season is that we take a few moments of quiet reflection, find that stillness in the heart of Christmas that's at the heart of Christmas. And look, really look at each other, not as Democrats or Republicans, not as members of Team Red or Team Blue, but as who we really are, fellow Americans, fellow human beings worthy of being treated with dignity and respect. I sincerely hope this holiday, this holiday season will drain the poison that has infected our politics and set us against one another. I hope this Christmas season marks a fresh start our nation, because there's so much that unites us as Americans, so much more 
that unites us than divides us. We're truly blessed to live in this nation. And I truly hope we take the time to look out, look out for one another, not at one, look for one another. Part of President Biden's Christmas message from the White House on Thursday. The House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy's spokesman Chad Gilmartin responding, how does Joe Biden get away with this phony unity rhetoric after he smeared half the country as domestic terrorists and compared anyone who opposes his radical agenda to segregationists? President Biden and First Lady Jill Biden today also visiting Children's National Hospital in Washington, D.C., meeting with and reading to young patients and thanking their families, doctors, nurses, and hospital staff. Thanks for listening to Washington Today. Subscribe to C-SPAN's evening newsletter, Word for Word, to get the stories Washington is talking about sent to your inbox every day. You can subscribe at c-span.org forward slash connect. Have a good night and holiday weekend.